Hi, hi, uh, Bill. Hi, Daniel. Uh, hi, Dan. Amazing, amazing to see you both um, today. Um, we are going to be joined at one point or another by Diana Butu and Nura Erika, but we've just uh, heard the, um, I guess, verdict of the International Court of Justice uh, in the case of uh, South Africa versus Israel. Um, it's, it's uh, in my opinion, it's already an historic moment, but you, you are both experts, so you, you can tell me why, if you agree with me. Um, Daniel, sort of, what are your thoughts? You know, what are your thoughts? You've just heard the provisional measures. I mean, it was already a victory that they gave provisional measures. Maybe you can briefly touch on, on this. Um, but then, what are your thoughts uh, about the margins? So, into one, yeah, my, into, my, yeah. yeah, yeah, my thoughts, uh, um, thank you, Frank, and my thoughts are that if by a very significant majority, which is important, I mean, any outcome is an outcome, and the, the court's ruling is the court, court's ruling, but it is significant that it's by such a big margin. And the, the fact that the U.S. judge, in terms of U.S. responses, is important. The U.S. judge was part of the majority, and the U.S. is obviously in a very significant global power in all of this and has been a, a veto-holding member of the Security Council in terms of um, where, when and if and when this reaches a Security Council again. But the fact that by such a large majority, there's been agreement that there is a plausible argument that there is a genocide or a risk of breaches of the Genocide Convention, technically is what the, the current finding is, um, that, that threshold has been met, that the threshold of the connection between the, the risk of irreparable harm to Palestinians in Gaza is such that the court was called upon and required, and, and it met the test, the legal test, for a requirement to indicate provis provisional measures. These are all hugely significant um, findings by the court, and every state in the world has to take note, especially every state that's a party to the Genocide Convention. In my view, and I'd be interested to hear Bill's view on this, this plausible argument of a genocide exceeds the, the duties that were, in my view, already incumbent, but it certainly completely crystallizes the, risk, the, the duties around the risk of genocide. And there are duties on states where there's a risk, um, which have been stated in previous ICJ jurisprudence, which Bill will know better than me, which indicate the requirement of states to take the measures that are reasonably available to them, and different states have different relationships with Israel, and therefore different ways in which they can influence um, Israel's compliance with the Genocide Convention. That now is, is fully clear. I believe it was clear, but we now have an authoritative ruling, even at this stage in these proceedings against Israel, brought by South Africa, that, in, that to me, resonate in terms of duties of, of acting on the risk of genocide. Uh, and those are, those are significant duties. They sh every state now needs to be positively taking steps to prevent the actions that Israel has continued to take uh, for now uh, months into this, these terrible events. Um, but again, I'd be interested in hearing um, about that. The one disappointing aspect is that, of course, South Africa asked for a ceasefire. Um, and in my view, there were ways of expressing a ceasefire which which allowed Israel to take um, what we what I would call policing measures, um, even whilst their armed forces are there, whether legally or not, um, and um, in relation to civilians inside Israel, that there there was a way of requiring Israel to cease all combat operation, which it did not decide was required as a uh, provisional measure. Uh, before this recording, we touched on the possibility that this could be revisited. And uh, given that Israel now has a month to issue a, a report stating what steps it has taken to comply with the measures that were indicated today, um, including its full compliance with all the requirements of IHL and the Genocide Convention, there will be a revisiting of these issues and potentially, therefore, the revisiting of the question of a ceasefire. So I, I hope that's helpful, but that's my, that's my preliminary response.
Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Bill, I'd, I'd love, obviously, for you to reply to Daniel, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. I, I wanted also you to maybe co comment on, because I think that's something people are not aware, that South Africa could revisit uh, its case. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if it's after a month when they see the report, or it could even be before months, if you can maybe clarify this. Um, thanks. Yes, it's not um, unknown for states to return to the court for um, another provisional measures order. You can ask for a provisional measures order at any time during the proceedings. And there are examples where, where, where countries have gone and asked more than once for provisional measures. So if there are changes, obviously you can't go on appeal of the decision. So South Africa can't go back tomorrow and say, we'd like you to revisit uh, what, what we ask you for and order a ceasefire. Um, but when there are significant changes in the situation or developments, it's in a position to do that. Of course, the that this is signaled in a way by the reporting obligation. So the idea that the court requires a report from Israel in one month and then requests comments from South Africa after means that this is this is an act of matter. This is not simply saying don't do something and then we'll wait until we get to the merits. You get that kind of a decision at a place like the European Court of Human Rights where you're where there's a case of someone fighting uh, extradition or deportation to a country where they could be subject to the death penalty or to torture. And the court will just say, don't do it. And that's it. It's a one off order and it's done. But clearly, this is there's something dynamic about this order because particularly because of the reporting obligation. And uh, perhaps after Israel makes its report, South Africa will seek another report uh, subsequently. Um, and and so this is this is not the end of the provisional measures order. That, that's all I, I'd say. So there there are two ways of getting at it. One is in the context of the report itself, and the other is simply the right of South Africa to return at any point if there is a, a significant change in the situation to ask for a new order. And so what about the findings uh, that, that, you know, Well, I think it's now. a remarkable achievement for South Africa to, to get this order. Um, I personally never uh, uh, expected them to get everything they asked for. Um, and I think in, on various occasions, maybe in the session I had with you, I would have said that, that I thought it was, it was you could hope for um, 100%, but that it was likely that South Africa would get something uh, in between, and that's what they've got. I think it's a very, very significant and important order uh, that achieves a great deal. And uh, it will be, uh, we'll, we, we shall see how it's implemented. We shall see whether there are changes in Israel's conduct as a result. Um, and as I say, if there are, then this will be uh, a, a matter to, perhaps to, to return to the court with. Um, the other thing about it, of course, is that it's, it's a big, um, it's very chastening for Israel to have this message from the court. Um, I, th I think when one assesses whether, you know, South Africa didn't get everything that they wanted, but maybe that's a way of telling us that it would have been hard to get 14 or 15 judges to be unanimous. Um, we all talk about this with our friends and people we know. And can you think of taking a cross section of 15 people you know and asking, could can we agree on what to do about Gaza and Israel? And you might have a fist fight and you might have, I mean, it's a remarkable achievement that the vast majority of the judges could agree on this. And that they, and we will see when we see the written, uh, the, the, whole, the full order, not just the the conclusions and the summary, but we see the full order, how significant that recognition is. Uh, and it strikes me that it will send a very powerful message. We've talked about in the past about this plausibility test and how it's a it's a it's a low threshold. But it nevertheless is a, it's an it's a very important message. I heard on a uh, on a CNN international this morning, uh, some spokesman for the government of Israel saying we expect them to throw the case out. 
well, now, actually, you cannot throw the case out at the provisional measures order, but it, it it's an indication of the kind of message one gets from Israel that this is a frivolous, absurd case. And obviously, that's not what the judges are saying. Uh, if there was any doubt about the seriousness and the gravity of the case, you would have seen more differences amongst the judges. You would have seen some of them will see the reasons. I'm, I presume that Judge Silbutindi is going to write um, a separate opinion explaining what her thinking is. And, and often it's the separate or the dissenting opinions that provide some clarification because you see what they might have been quarreling about when they were deliberating, what, what it is. So I, I'm anxious to see what she says, not so much to know what her opinion is. It's clearly she's very isolated in her views in the court, but because that will sharpen our appreciation of what the real message is of the of the judgment. And uh, people have also said that, you know, will Israel, Israel will be defiant or it will be indifferent to, to the message. And, and maybe it was that was always to be expected. But this is not just a message to Israel. It's an order to Israel, but it's a message to the whole world. Uh, and it's a message to the Security Council. And I don't think we can rule out the fact that this will provide a basis to return with some, you know, carefully drafted draft resolution to the Security Council where uh, it will be able to get through the council, perhaps with a few abstentions from the usual suspects, but without a negative vote from a permanent member. Maybe I'm imagining things or dreaming, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't exclude this. I think if if with the right wording and the right reference to the order of the of the court, that this will be hard to resist in the in the Security Council. Uh, and of course, it will provide, it will strengthen other efforts, both in political bodies, like the Human Rights Council, the General Assembly, various regional bodies, uh, but also uh, litigation in other fora, including at the domestic level. So I know that today the 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 case that was filed by the Center for Constitutional Rights uh, is being argued in the in the in the a court in the United States. And I would expect that the counsel for the Center for Constitutional Rights are going to be anxious to put this decision, this ruling before the judges and the counsel for the for the respondents or the defendants in that case are going to be anxious to make sure that the judge doesn't see it. So uh, it, it's 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 going to be helpful in many uh, areas, some of which are, are are we don't even appreciate. They're they'll surprise us where this ruling will be important and significant. So it's a, it's a very, very, very important development. Thanks, Will. Can I ask you both, and Daniel, let me know if, you, if you're ready, but uh, I mean, the question now is the, okay, historic ruling, but what is the what now? What is the what next? Israel, let's wait to hear from them, but they've you know said before that they won't respect, I mean, the International Criminal Court will not stop us, uh, but it's a binding decision. It's the highest judicial body court in, in the world. So um, what is the, because I mean, the way I read it again, and we spoke about this uh, before, is that they haven't called for a ceasefire, but at 15 to two, and then 16 to one, they've asked for Israel to uh, stop engaging in bombing buildings. Uh, they've asked Israel to stop impeding humanitarian aid. They have to ask Israel to stop obstructing ambulances or the work of hospitals. Uh, they've, in a way, they've told Israel, they haven't told Israel to cease fire, but they've told them to stop conducting the war the way Israel has conducted it for, for, for so long. So, you know, it's not a ceasefire, but it's like you have to radically do things different. So what can Israel do? I, I know you're not either an Israeli general or politician. What, you know, what should they do? And but then, what the international world, like the community, the countries should do? Because they have strong obligations after this ruling, right? Uh, maybe Bill, you can start. Daniel, your your screen is. We now see you. Uh, oh yeah, no, it's better now. Yeah. 
do you want do you want to jump in, Daniel? And then we can let you go because I know you've got um. Forgive me. Um, yes, I'm trying to come get access to the order, which has now been published, by the way. Um, so it is it is up there. So I think we all need to take time to take stock of, of the detail of what's been published, which, as I say, has just, just, just come out um, in the last half an hour from the court. Um, so well worth reading. I've shared a copy with you, in fact, on email, um, Frank. Um, well, look. Uh, I, I'm spotting a lot of disappointment in Palestinian circles um, ab about the ceasefire. I've just been looking at the, uh, the various things that have been circulating. So there is bitter disappointment about that. But I think um, there is also, I believe, when people have a chance to absorb this, all the things that we've just been discussing earlier in this conversation, all of the findings are a platform. It's disappointing. I believe there was sufficient basis on which the, the court could have concluded that the, the link between the, the irreparable harm to Palestinians um, and the, um, the measures required them to, to order a ceasefire. But now we have to see how the world responds to this plausible argument finding of genocide and breaches of the Genocide Convention. And I think it's it's now advocacy and lawyers, advocacy groups and lawyers need to re demand of our governments that they step up to the plate now on the basis of these legal findings. And this should re return to the Security Council and all pressure has to be applied on Israel. And then if that fails and this these terrible events continue as we've already touched on, there's an opportunity for South Africa to go back. I just very much hope that this this marks a sea change in the pronouncements and policy statements of all of these uh, powers, some of whom had judges from their nations um, uh, as part of this huge majority of the court. On that note, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave you. But um, I'd be interested to uh, catch up with what everyone else has responded to on this. Thanks. Thanks for joining us you know, on a very uh, busy day, Daniel. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Uh, Bill, Diana is about to join us actually in about, I think, 10 okay. minutes, she said. But uh, uh, so responding to the, the what now, in a way, what is the, the, the duty or the obligation of Israel? And what, is, what are the duties of third parties and other states? Well, yeah, let me say I, I, I now have the, the order in front of me. It, it's 29 pages long, and I, I haven't read uh, all of it. But like most lawyers, I go to the back, the, the final page on the judgment first. We always do that to see who won and, and who lost. I'm looking at one of the orders, which I, I'm not sure was even directly requested by South Africa, but it's a very remarkable one. It's also remarkable if for no other reason that it has the the vote of of the ad hoc judge Barak from Israel as well, and it it reads as follows: the state of Israel shall take immediate and effective measures to enable the provision of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance to address the adverse conditions of life faced by Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. So this is not a, this is not an order not to do things. Um, it's not an order not to kill people, not to use armed force. It's an order to do things. Implicit in that order is uh, the suggestion that they're not being these measures are not being taken at present. And the the addition of the word immediate is interesting in the in the the order that immediately precedes it, dealing with direct and public incitement. They don't use the word immediate. Uh, they just say take all measures within its power. So adding that those words immediate and effective measures is is a very strong message. When I say message, it's not a message. It's an order. Uh, and like all orders, uh, it's all going to be in the detail uh, to see how that is implemented. But Israel will have to provide in a month uh, a report. Uh, of the measures it has taken subsequent to the 26th of January, 2024, the immediate and effective measures it's taken 
to enable the provision of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance. I think this is a very, very um, important uh, order of the court. Um, so, you know, um, Daniel was saying before that that uh, there's a lot of disappointment. Um, you know, it, 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 I, I, I think, I, I don't want to sound facetious about this, it's a bit like a child on Christmas morning opening their presents and saying, well, where are the batteries in the present? Um, it's, it's, this is a, this is. I'm sorry, it muted. This is a, this is a great achievement. And uh, while I can understand that, that people would have liked more, you have to understand this, this, there are limits to what you can get in a provisional measures order. This is, this is, it's not a judgment on the merits. Nobody's won or lost the case yet. And uh, the court also has to um, take care uh, not to prejudice the outcome of the final proceedings. And so there's a, a delicate balance there to be achieved. And the court has probably come pretty close to it, again, with just a remarkable unanimity in the court. We're promised a dissenting opinion from Judge Sabutindi. We'll see what that is. And a few of the judges also have uh, uh, indicated that that they will be writing separate or individual opinions. We'll, we'll await those. All of those will clarify a little more the, the scope and the meaning, maybe tell us things that they didn't quite agree upon. Um, so, yeah, I, what can what more can be said then? Uh, is your question about what will Israel do next? I don't know that yeah, Israel I mean, will do anything. Hmm. I, I don't know that they'll do anything in response to it. But if they don't do anything in response to it, this is not the last they will have heard from the International Court of Justice. And it's going to alienate them from a lot of their friends who, uh, as has been pointed out, when previous orders were made in, in genocide cases, the one against the, the Russian Federation two years ago, the one against Myanmar four years ago, many of the Western countries that are very friendly to Israel made statements reminding Russia and Myanmar that these orders are binding. They have to respect them. And so that's going to be, obviously, this order is a great tool that we will then facilitate scrutiny over Israel's conduct. It's not going to create a Palestinian state. It's not going to end the armed conflict. But 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 and people people who thought that the armed conflict would end at two o'clock in the afternoon Central European time on the twenty sixth of uh, January were not being realistic. That's that that was that was not. The court isn't able to do that. It doesn't have the power to do it, um, and uh, and and so this is this is pretty good. And and I want to ask you as well in terms of the margins. It's it's very hard because you can imagine what Israel is uh, is probably planning to say after the the ruling. And if you have like eight judge judges versus seven, Israel could say. Oh look, it's very divided. It's against you know the global South voted against us, but it's I mean most of the provisional measures it was either fifteen to two, including the Israeli judge, or sixteen to one. So, it, what can Israel come back with in terms of like oh it's the you know this global makes South makes it very us. hard for them. You're quite right. These very large majorities, including a few of the orders that their own judge voted for. These very, very, you know, near unanimous rulings are are um, are, are very difficult to to resist. Um, Daniel was referring to the um, the American judge. People call the president uh, uh, Donahue the American judge. Of course, she comes from the United States, but these judges are independent. They they may have tendencies to lean in the direction of the country or the region of the world from 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 where they come but uh, they're independent they're they're not taking orders um and they're um you know that the, 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 it's it's i i wouldn't the, these are 15 serious credible uh judges 
highly qualified, experienced professional. And um, if it's so obvious to them, then it should be obvious to the entire planet, is my view. And as I say, I go back to wording like wording uh, like this order, immediate and effective measures to enable the provision of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance. This is a huge order. Um, and as I say, 16 votes to one. It, it's, it's, you know, it's impressive. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. As, as you see, Bill, hopefully you, we've been joined by Nura. Nura, um, you know, thanks a million because I know it's very early for you. I know you're also flying today very, very soon. Um, so we've, we've been talking with Bill and Daniel. Daniel had to go because he's also in court. Um, so what are, what are your thoughts? Like, you know, it's very fresh. Um, oh, you muted, Nura. Nura, you muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Bill. It's lovely to be here with you and, and to see you. I am about to catch a flight, so I can't join you for long. Um, but I watched this morning. My reaction, I think, is echoing um, Bill's here, which is um, vindication, relief, especially the way that Judge Donahue began with providing context um, as if this began on October 7th as opposed to the context that was provided by the South African legal team, which framed it in 75 years of settler colonialism and ongoing Nakba, um, I began watching with some stress and trepidation that the court could actually, uh, you know, not find the most basic and, and what we consider the most obvious finding of a plausibility that Israel was committing genocide and failing um, and or failing to prevent genocide. and. In that instance, I wouldn't have been surprised because what we knew from the beginning is that this was also a trial of international law itself and the legal institutions that have failed to, to honestly uh, end this ongoing genocide 111 days today and what failed to prevent us from, from 75 years of settler colonization, failed to dismantle apartheid, failed to lift the siege, failed to end the occupation. And so had they come out to a different decision, for me, it would have been an indictment of the legal institutions and the law itself that they found otherwise. And instead, that they echoed the findings of several uh, UN officials, multi multilateral institutions, that they recognize that this was not uh, necessarily legitimate warfare that was um, characterized by crimes uh, against humanity and war crimes, but instead was plausibly genocidal in its total attack on the Palestinian population and people that they found um, that there was a risk of irreparable harm should provisional measures not be ordered uh, was uh, relief and vindication of what Palestinians have said and and what millions have echoed, I agree that the near unanimity of the court, 16 to 1, otherwise 15 to 2, with is, um, is the Israeli judge and the Ugandan judge indicated that this was as obvious to them as it has been to us. And regardless of the outcome, regardless of what they would have said, even if they did order um, you know, provisional measures to cease military hostilities, the onus of that order would have remained on the people and would have remained on, on them to agitate with their governments in order to, to you know, cease the hostilities, to work towards that in the Security Council, to continue asking for a uniting for peace resolution, to continue uh, to ask for the imposition of weapons sanctions to move towards prosecution in, in national courts under universal jurisdiction. And so the work is the same. The work is the same. And what the ICJ has provided this morning is another tool um, for the people uh, in their continuation of that work. Yeah, can I quickly follow up on something? How does this impact, you think, the CCR case against Biden in the U.S.? That actually I don't necessarily today. think that the, I don't necessarily think that there's impact on the, the CCR case today that's going to be held in a few hours, which charges Biden, Blinken and Austin 
with um, failure to prevent genocide and complicity in genocide per their obligations under the Genocide Convention, which is incorporated not only under customary law and therefore federal law in the United States, but the U.S. You know, as a state party. Um, what we've seen from Judge White's questions to the petitioners is mostly on grounds of political question doctrine. The political question doctrine is um, a judicial rule that basically establishes that if a question is better suited to another branch of government, the executive or the legislative and the judiciary should defer, not because they can't necessarily make a legal judgment, but because they're not the best suited to make that judgment. And that's what that's mostly going to turn on. The CCR attorneys are going to have to demonstrate why there's actually precedent where the U.S. has intervened when similar questions have been raised, which I think they can demonstrate. They're also going to have to demonstrate that genocide is not merely a political, uh, is not a political question, but is just seeable, and that there are legal grounds to find that conclusion. I think that they have a robust case. I'm excited to watch uh, their argument, which will begin at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Um, but I don't think that these are, are connected. And maybe, Noura, a final question, and then I'll let you go. Um, I see a lot of stuff already on social media so from the Palesti from Palestinians. Some of some are very upset that there's no call for a ceasefire. Some are actually tweeting, we won. Um, the South Africa legal team seems to be very happy with, with what, what happened. Um, I know it's not a case of winning or losing, because the people in Gaza are definitely losing, even still today. They're still dying. But the fact that the court came back with provisional measures does imply that there's a plausibility of a genocide, right? Uh, did I get that right or, or no? Yes, yes. No, no, no. This is non-controversial. I'm sure Bill covered this as well. Uh, you know, I, I understand the frustration of not getting an order for the cessation of military hostilities. I want to emphasize to the audience that that doesn't mean um, that, the, that the court might not have thought that they were necessary, but on a legal question might, might not have, might not have found that that was within its purview to provide this wasn't a case that asked about you know israel whether or not israel had the right um to attack the palestinians in gaza or what they say to attack hamas in the name of self defense this was about the plausibility of genocide and in so far as that was raised, um, they answered in the affirmative that there was a plausible reason to believe that there's genocide and failure to prevent genocide. And they did order um, for the cessation of genocidal acts for the provision of humanitarian aid and so on and so forth. So I wouldn't take their failure to, to say that there was, you know, to order a cessation of hostilities as any kind of, you know, loss or betrayal that can turn on a legal question um, and the way that the question was framed initially. The other thing I want to emphasize is even if they had ordered an immediate ceasefire, that that wouldn't have been forthcoming. The ICJ doesn't have the course of authority to impose a ceasefire that still remains within the purview of the Security Council under Chapter 7 authorities. And so we shouldn't see this as an opportunity lost for us, but still as another tool available to continue to agitate for that. With that, I do have to leave. I apologize. Bill, I'll continue to listen to you. Thank you for everything. Thanks, Nura. Thanks for popping, popping in. Thanks. Thanks. Bill, uh, I will also let you go very shortly, and, and uh, Diana is about to, to join us at any moment. But I want to come back to, to to a point. So, what is is there like a, now a duty or an obligation for other states after this ruling, or it doesn't really change anything? They, they had an obligation to act before this ruling, uh, but you know, or, or does it? Well, the order doesn't uh, in itself create any obligations on other states because there are parties to the litigation. This is a strict legal issue, but at the same time, the order uh, creates the circumstances in the situation um, that, that have an, a legal impact on other states. Uh, one issue, this is one of the issues, by the way, that's involved in the litigation in the United States as well, is the obligation to prevent genocide, which has an extraterritorial scope. So it's very clear in international law that states have a duty to prevent genocide outside their borders, as well as within their territory. 
and that means that they uh, it, it's a it's an obligation that is is a variable obligation that depends on the extent of their influence over those states and so obviously some states are are closer to israel than others and probably in a stronger position to have that influence with the united states of course being at the absolute top of the pyramid but many other states who who are providing assistance in in a diplomatic sense material assistance and military assistance so for all of them this obligation it existed before but it's reinforced by uh, parts of the ruling of the court that give an air of reality to the claim of genocide and that strengthens the argument that there is a serious risk of genocide the the criterion for uh, the for for the obligation this is under the 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 law of the court uh, for the obligation to prevent genocide kicks in when there's a serious risk of genocide and several of the paragraphs in the judgment uh, give momentum to that argument they don't resolve it entirely and of course that's not what they're deciding in the order but nevertheless it's clear that they've gone out of their way to make some very specific points uh, I want to go back for a minute because now I, I've got the the whole text of the order in front of me, not just the the specific orders that are made. But when we talk about the order, we mean the whole document, the twenty nine page document. They're reviewing issues relating to the uh, treatment of the people of Gaza, and it says in paragraph seventy that the court considers that the people in the Gaza Strip remain extremely vulnerable. It talks about the impact. It's not saying that Israel denies this or that uh, South Africa claims it. It's a it's a factual conclusion or a statement by the court. They talk about tens of thousands of deaths. So from in the future, maybe instead of saying according to Hamas, uh, there are so many thousands of deaths. Now we can say according to the International Court of Justice. There are tens of thousands of deaths and injuries, destruction of homes, schools, and so on. And then they conclude that paragraph saying, at present, many Palestinians have no access to the most basic foodstuffs, potable water, electricity, essential medicines, or heating. Then the court goes on in paragraph 72 to say, in these circumstances, it considers the, and I quote, catastrophic humanitarian situation and they say it is at serious risk of deteriorating further before the court renders its final judgment. Now, the court is not ruling on the obligation to prevent genocide. That issue is not before the court. But it's coming pretty close to saying there's a serious risk of genocide in these paragraphs. Uh, it also notes, and this is paragraph 73, it says Israel's statement that it's taken certain steps to alleviate, uh, to to address and alleviate the conditions faced by the population in the Gaza Strip, the court says, while such steps are to be encouraged, they are insufficient to remove the risk that irreparable prejudice will be caused before the court issues its final decision in the case. So the court is ordering Israel to do things about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. I can only point out that they didn't even do this in the Myanmar case four years ago. So it's a, a further indication of the the the, the richness of this order uh, and its its important contribution to the uh, to the to the evolving situation. Uh, th thank you, Bill. Um, I I I very much again appreciate that you took the time to. Uh, to, to talk to me and, and Daniel, uh, Leon, and Nura. Uh, Diana was, is on Democracy Now! She will, I guess, join me. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, I'll let you uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Uh, thanks again, Bill. Okay, Frank. It's nice to talk to you. Thanks. Bye-bye. I was joined by Daniel and Nura joined us for you know, about five, ten minutes. Uh, but still, Excellent. you know, I'd love Excellent. to hear your thoughts. I, you know, in the, in the meantime, I've, I've been reading stuff um, uh, on Al Jazeera, some Palestinians are very upset. There's no call for a ceasefire. Some Palestinians say actually it's everything but a call for a ceasefire. You everything. know, it's it's yeah. everything. It's everything. So okay, let me step back. So, um, 
Look, I think it's important for everybody to understand what this is and what this moment is. This is the moment where Israeli impunity finally sees the end. It finally sees an end. The decision is quite a comprehensive one. The fact that the court said, and they came out and they spelled out the four main things. One is that Israel has to undertake measures to prevent genocide. What does that mean other than ceasefire? That their soldiers have to undertake measures to prevent genocide. Again, what does that mean other than a ceasefire? That uh, three, that there has to be effective humanitarian assistance. How do you get humanitarian assistance in without a ceasefire? And then, um, of course, the fourth one, which is the idea that that Israel needs to go after these people who've been issuing genocidal statements. That part is really important because the genocidal statements haven't just been coming from, you know, soldiers that are in the field. This is coming from very high up. And it was very important that the court cited three individuals. They cited the Minister Gallant, who um, cut off fuel, water, electricity, and food supplies, and of course, has prevented medical supplies. They cited Katz and his statements. And of course, they cited Herzog and his statements. And so the court made it clear that they're looking at these statements from people who are very high up and they're demanding that Israel stop. I think that this is a decisive blow to, to Israel and it's a victory for Palestine. It's just such, it's just, it's so soul crushing that it had to come to this, Frank, that we had to be at a point where uh, we're at 100,000 Palestinians who've either been killed or injured and with 2.3 million Palestinians terrorized, and with so much of the Gaza Strip destroyed. You made a point about um, the immediate um, you know, flow of humanitarian aid. A very interesting point that Bill mentioned, because he's, he's read now the, the more detailed findings, is that even the Israeli judge voted in favor of that. It was 16 to 1, and the dissenting right. judge was not the Israeli judge. Yes, And I think what's important to, rem to remind people is that the simple fact that the court came back with provisional measures means that in the eye of the, eye of the court, there is a risk, a plausibility of a genocide happening. So this is imminent massive. Imminent risk. That's mm. the, the issue is that there are, there's an imminent risk. And, and that part is so important because it, it, it casts aside all of the Israeli propaganda that, um, that where they've said that they've been doing everything so gently. You know, you and I have seen the videos. We know what's going on there. And the fact that we're now, it feels that we're vindicated, that we have a court that's saying exactly what you and I and others have been saying now for the past 112 days. It's very, very, very important. And and and, um, and and finally, it'd be my the way to to finish. Like what, um, like what now? Like what now in regards to? I mean, I've I've read a few statements from Israel. Uh, Netanyahu just released a video saying, uh, "We are continuing our war, and we're respecting international law." Then uh, another guy, I think Smotrich, received uh, uh, tweeted, "Hag Shmeg or something. I don't know what it yes, means. Yes, of course. But uh, so Israel might do nothing about it, but now it's not even about Israel anymore, right? It's about everybody else and every state. So, you know, and the Security Council was potentially in the, you know, anyway, what are your thoughts? This is precisely the point, though, Frank, when you, when you step back and you think about what happened in 2004. So in 2004, the ICJ issued its ruling in regard to the wall. And in that ruling, and it, I, I'm bringing this up for a reason, in that ruling, the court says not only is Israel's wall illegal, but that third states, like other countries around the world, have to do something to make sure that international law is upheld. And we as Palestinians, we waited. We waited for a full year expecting that the world is going to respect their world court. And that they're going to do something. And sure enough, they didn't. 
But that is what led to the rebirth of the BDS movement. The BDS movement was launched exactly one year after the ICJ ruling. So the ICJ ruling was July the 9th of 2004. BDS was relaunched on July the 9th, 2005. Similarly now, as I said, the era of Israeli impunity is over because even no matter what Israel does, the BDS movement is going to be strengthened. No matter what Israel says, we see that countries around the world are going to be watching and obligate Israel to uphold its uh, obligations under international law. And, but more importantly, it's we, we the people, are the ones who can be pushing for this. And we will continue to push for this. You know, law is just simply a tool. It's not the end goal. It's just simply a tool. And we now have yet another tool that we can use to make sure that Israel is held to account and that Palestinians are finally able to live freely without this genocide, without this genocide. We can do it. We can do it. And this ruling is just yet another step. Thanks, Diana. Um, Nura said exactly the same. It's it's an, another tool and a very important one in empowering us, the people, to actually end Israel's impunity. Absolutely, and but you know it's important to make the link between th um, these legal tools and BD and our grassroots movements, right? So this, so the legal tool in two thousand four is what led to the revitalization of the BDS movement in two thousand and five. Uh, this now is also leading to pushing to hold Israel accountable. It's yet another tool for us, and it's going to lead to yet again the revitalization of the BDS movement, which is already growing and strong. It's an amazing way to end. Um, it's Thank been a, such an incredible day in a way, so tense and so um, emotional as well. Yeah. Um, but um, so thanks, thanks, Dinah. Thank you. Anytime. Bye. Anytime. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.